Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you had a beautiful uh, uh, screening. I'm very pleased to be talking with the director of the film, Monsieur Eugène Green, and we're going to have a discussion uh, to talk a little bit uh, more about the, the, the film you about you just so. Uh, so it's something that I've uh, mentioned briefly in the introduction. Um, uh, a lot of your films uh, explore uh, the, the good and evil, evil in, in, in people. Uh, it's something that we find uh, from nearly all of your work, uh, you know, talking about films we've uh, seen before. And the latest one was The Son of Joseph that played in the festival uh, a few years ago uh, in live, <laughs> not virtual. <laughs> Uh, so, um, in this film in particular, you have a lot of opposition in, of um, good and evil, but also uh, you have the mortal and the immortal, you have the duality uh, presented with the, the, the twin brothers, uh, so one is born a few minutes before the other one. Uh, you also have the man versus woman, as the goddess Mary and the devil who is a man. Uh, the devil and the monks. So, you know, a lot of like things are in opposition. So can you talk to us a little bit about the duality that you're exploring and that you find in the characters and also in nature, which is very present in the film? Yes, well, uh, the, the myth that the film is, uh, is based on um, is, uh, is related, of course, uh, is clearly uh, expresses the theme of good and evil, uh, but also um, through the goddess Mary, who is the uh, the main uh, the the great goddess in the uh, in the old Basque religion before they became Christians. Um, Mary is is an expression of nature itself. And like nature, she is neither good nor evil. She can be, uh, from a human point of view, either good or evil, according to her, her mood. Um, but the, <clears throat> the religious tradition in the, among the Basques, uh, since they had this former religion, uh, pagan religion, and then they were Christianized, <clears throat> their, <clears throat> pardon, their religious thought became a sort of a, a form of synchronism. And um, so Mari was a, a celebration of nature, the, the sacrality of and the, the sacredness of nature, but with no um, moral value because nature can be uh, a, a, a towards uh, humans either good or uh, bad, um, uh, nice or not nice. Uh, and um, but Christianism gave them uh, a moral uh, framework to to the idea of choosing between good and evil, and so these two um, these two tr religious traditions are present in the film. Um, so um, Marie, uh, she has two sons, uh, one of whom becomes uh, Michelach, uh, becomes a disciple of the devil and Atarabi who revolts against the devil. Um, and uh, uh, both of them, for example, in the storm, the episode of the storm, which is found in all the versions of the myth, uh, um, Mikelac uh, asks Mary to bring a storm to destroy the crops and uh, even kill people. And then Atarabi, and she accepts to do it. And then Atarabi convinces her uh, not to do it. And so uh, you see the both possible aspects of, uh, of nature who are both embodied in, in Mari. And of course, the other forms of dualism, which you uh, mentioned, are all present in the film. And dualism is a form of actually of uh, oxymoron, which is something which is uh, important for me because it was very important in Baroque culture, that is, uh, an oxymoron uh, finally is the is the closest that we can become to truth because truth is not as people think since the 18th century something which is clear and absolute but it always contains its opposite uh, i can i can say a lot more about that but perhaps uh, you ask me another question and i'll answer in a more precise way uh, that was actually an, an interesting answer because you managed to go to the Baroque, which is a strong element of your theatrical work as well. 
Um, but to, to continue a little bit on the Basque uh, mythology, as well as the Christian uh, tales that, are, that we found in this film, can you tell us a little bit more about the research you did uh, to talk about these Basque uh, tales or, or stories, um, which is mixed with traditional folklore also, and the song and dance that we can see uh, either with the country boar or sometimes when the devils are dancing in the bar, which is pretty funny. Um, and so it was mostly literary research or like you, is there a tradition of oral tales, maybe more in the Basque uh, um, uh, storytelling, maybe stronger than literary, I'm not sure. And, and finally, to finish that question, I would like to know more about the origin of the great character, which is resembling like what we call Bigfoot or Yeti, which is uh, Basajun, Basajun? Basayam. Basayam, okay. Uh, yes, well, um, for, for the research, actually, um, Basque literature goes back to the 16th century, but it's uh, the old Basque literature of the 16th, 17th century is, um, is modern in the sense that it's European, in the sense that it corresponds to uh, European literature in other countries. And so we don't find the Basque mythology in Basque literature or the old uh, Basque literature, but it was transmitted orally. And um, I mainly ba base my research on the writings of um, uh, an, an anthropologist who is also a pr uh, priest, a Catholic priest, uh, Jose Miguel Bandariaran, who was, uh, he was from the Southern Basque country, but in 1939, he had to, uh, seek uh, refuge in, in the northern Basque country uh, because of the, the war, because in, in the Basque country, the, the Catholic Church was on the Republican side and many uh, Catholic priests were executed by the, uh, the Frankists when they took over in the Basque country. So he came to the northern Basque country, to the village of, um, in French, it's Sar in Basque, Shara. And he did a lot of, uh, there was still a lot of, um, oral uh, literature available. That is, people kept telling the same tales and the same myths. And so he collected them. They had all been uh, earlier collections, but he was a very serious uh, anthropologist, a real anthropologist. And uh, he recorded um, different versions of the different myths, uh, fortunately, because today uh, that oral tradition has been interrupted. But we do have uh, his writings uh, and uh, I based my uh, my research mainly on them. There are some other also um, uh, specialists of Basque, Basque mythology, which I, I've read also. And um, and so uh, this myth, <clears throat> there are lots of different versions of it, but I took the main elements of the myth. And then as any um, writer or artist in any uh, in any field who, who uses a myth, I, uh, I adapted it to my own needs, needs. I made my own version of it. So uh, I added some things like the character of uh, Udana uh, and her daughter, um, uh, Ushua, uh, who, who are not in the, the original myth. Um, and so the, the, the second miracle that Atarabi uh, performs, the resurrection of the little girl, is not in the uh, traditional myth. The first miracle is the fact that he he makes he convinces Mari to um, to um, uh, uh, to make the storm go away, and um, so um, as far as the music, um, there's also a tradition of Basque music which has been uh, um, which has been transmitted uh, orally or musically, but. Uh, uh, there, there is written music also from the 16th century on, but uh, I, I worked with uh, certain Basque musicians whom I knew already. Uh, so, um, for example, uh, the fandango, the dance, the dance that they do at the country ball, uh, that was uh, I, I met um, Antion Kuruche, the, the who plays the um, uh, tricky teacher, the, the Basque accordion. 
uh, and uh, I asked him to compose uh, a fandango. Uh, there are a lot of the, he knows a lot of traditional ones, but I asked him to compose one for the film, and that's how we got that music. Um, <clears throat> the song at the beginning is written by Joël Mérat, uh, whom you see, he's a, a composer who lives in Bayonne, and uh, whom you see in my Basque uh, documentary, uh, Faire la Parole. And, uh, and it's sung by Maji Oyenart, who you see also in Faire la Parole, and whom you see in, um, in Atara Bie Mikulac, because she plays the mother of Udana, and you see her sing also later on. When, when she sings in, in Atara Bie Mikulac, it's a traditional song, which she, she sings from uh, the Sul, the province, the Basque province that she comes from. And the... Um, the Devil's Music was written by uh, the devil himself, that is Thierry Biscari, who is mainly a musician and singer. You also see him in Faire la Parole. And uh, I asked him to compose something for the dance of the, of the devils. And he used as a text, he used um, uh, a, con uh, how do you say, a, contin a, con contin uh, a nursery rhyme, a Basque nursery rhyme. That's the, the, the words that you hear. And uh, on the, um, the end credits, he also wrote the music for the end credits. And there was um, a text by uh, Itaro Borda, uh, a Basque uh, poetess who did the translation for the, uh, into Basque of my script written in English. Is that about, <laughs> I, have I about answered your question? Yes, so now you need to tell us a little bit more about uh, Basa Basayun. Oh, yes, uh, Basayun. <laughs> Well, it's a sort of ab uh, abominable, abominable, <laughs> abominable snowman of the, of the Pyrenees. Uh, he's a traditional character in Basque mythology. <clears throat> Up until the beginning of the 20th century, a lot of Basques in the mountains saw him, but uh, recently he hasn't been cited too often. Uh, but he's, uh, his name means literally... Um, the 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 savage the the wild lord uh, and he's a sort of you know, a, a sort of a primitive man but i in i related to him to a basque myth about the yentilak the, the uh, yentilak uh, it comes from the latin word uh, which gave the french word uh, gentil uh, in the sense of uh, uh, pagans uh, that is uh, the 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 basque believed that uh, before before Christianism came to the Basque country, uh, they had, well, they did have their own religion, but the Basques were uh, bigger and more robust uh, men. And um, there's a, a, a Basque myth about uh, a, a wise man of, of the uh, Yentilak who sees Christ coming in, on a cloud. And when he sees him, he says, uh, that's the end of our race, and he commits suicide. And the other uh, Yentilak, they hide under a big rock. And so uh, Bashayan in, in my film says that he's the only Yentilak who remained uh, and who accepted Christianism, but who continued to believe in the old gods. So he represents, in fact, this uh, uh, syncretic uh, religion, which the Basques uh, do have. And um, what... Um, the, the, the scene, uh, the scene with uh, Bashayon, it's a bit complex what they say, but what uh, um, the 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 superior father, the what do you say in English, the superior father the, of the in the monastery, he sends um, he sends Atarabi to see um, Bashayon because he thinks he's perhaps the only uh, person or being in any case who can help him. And uh, what he makes um, what he makes Atarabi realize is that uh, is that he doesn't know nothing is sure that it, what he says is all this mystery, and that's the greatest wisdom that he could possibly give him. And it's a um, it's an opposition to the modern to modern thought, which believes that uh, reason is a sort of uh, a superior is as actually has replaced God. And that reason is something which is absolute, which can bring us to uh, to absolute uh, truths. But uh, what Basayon knows and what he makes Atarabi realize is that everything is is a mystery, 
and that's what enables uh, Atahabi to accomplish the resurrection of the of the little girl who is dead. Thank you. <laughs> I'm good to go maybe in a more uh, practical um, questions now. Um, you mentioned your documentary, uh, Faire la Parole, which I believe was the first time you worked uh, in the Basque uh, region with uh, Basque people in uh, talking about that language. Yes. But typically, uh, this is a fiction film, so it's much different to get uh, actors and, and, and to play. So I. I can imagine it must have been difficult to find um, actors, you know, not, not necessarily professional, as you worked with professional and non-professional actors before. But you know, what what the need comes first? Is it to speak the Basque language to be an actor, or to be able to combine everything? So I'm sure it was pretty challenging to be able to um, to to get this uh, in the film, and it worked really well. But I, I'm I'm sure it was very difficult. Yes. So can you talk a little so bit much. more? About that? <laughs> uh, yes, it was very difficult. Uh, fortunately, I had a very competent assistant for the Basque language, uh, Audrey Oc, um, whom uh, who is already my assistant for Faire la Parole, uh, and whom you see briefly in Faire la Parole, in one scene where you see me also uh, in a in a bar watching um, one of the young people who is on television and you see her briefly in the ball in the um, the country ball she's one of the um, people but in any case uh, not only she helped me with the language but she was also um, uh, my casting uh, agent uh, at first because uh, it's it was very complicated uh, it was it was uh, logical that the the uh, actors that I would be looking for are in the Basque country, but I live in Paris. And so um, at least in a, uh, to make a first selection of actors, uh, she went around, um, uh, we, we put, um, we put um, annou announcements in the newspapers and on radio, and she did uh, auditions where just she had them speak and she filmed them. She had them speak in Basque and then a little bit in French and uh, or, no, mainly in French or in Castilian and then a little bit in Basque also. And she was uh, also able to tell if they really spoke Basque well. And um, at first, uh, at first I was trying to get professional actors because there are quite a few professional Basque actors, but mainly in Southern Basque country in, um, in Donostia and uh, Bilbao. Uh, because there, now there are quite a few Basque films made, but in, on the other side. Um, but the, the professional Basque actors whom I met, um, since most of them, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, understandable, of course, uh, to earn their living. They also um, play in a lot of films in Castilian, in Spanish, and, um, and on television. And in, uh, there are very, very good filmmakers in, in Spain, but... Uh, there's also a lot of commercial films which are really not very good and uh, Spanish television is at least as bad as French television and so <laughs> uh, and so uh, the professional actors whom I met they already had a lot of ticks uh, things that would be hard to get rid of uh, in, to make them act in my style and so I started seeing non-professional actors or young very young people who wanted to be actors but who had just had a few uh, a uh, few uh, theater classes or things like that. And um, it was for the main roles, it, it was becoming very difficult. Uh, uh, Audrey was showing me a lot of people and it, it just, I didn't see the people that I needed. And then there was one of them, uh, for, uh, for the, that was for the two, uh, the two boy, the two brothers. Uh, there was one of them whom I found interesting and it was uh, Lukas Hiriat. Um, who plays uh, Nicolas, and uh, I found him interesting. And then he said uh, he had a cousin um, who was actually, at that time he was presently in Belgium, but normally he's in the Basque country, and uh, who the same age as him, and who, who, uh, who used to do theater with him. And uh, so uh, um, his cousin, uh, Shaya, we couldn't, Audrey couldn't film him, but he, he filmed himself and he sent me a first uh, video, which I found very interesting. So he came to Paris and I met him. 
And then gradually, that's how I met the two brothers. And then in the same way, after seeing a lot of girls, I finally met um, Ainara uh, Lehmanns, who is half Belgian, actually, but uh, she, was, uh, she was brought up in the Basque country and she speaks Basque. And, um, and so that's how we ended up finding, I, we ended up finding uh, all the actors. So uh, it was convenient for me also that those three main actors came from the Northern Basque country because I was able to communicate with them in French. But like and, uh, Thierry Biscari aussi also who plays the devil, um, but uh, Pablo Lasha who plays the, the superior father, do you say? I don't know what to say. Uh, the, 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 the father of, of the, the superior of the, the monastery. Uh, he's from the southern Basque country, doesn't speak French. And um, many of the smaller parts also came from the southern Basque country. And so Audrey was also my uh, interpreter. Uh, we, we did that in French and, and Basque, but it, it worked out very well. But so were you able to direct them when they were shooting? You would use yes. French, Audrey would use Basque, and for Castillan? Well, uh, since uh, Basque, I've studied the Basque language, but it's so difficult that uh, if I don't have a year to do nothing else but learn Basque, I could never master it. But I had, uh, I know the structures of the language and uh, I have a ba basic vocabulary. And since it was my script, which was translated into Basque, I was able to, I know what, I knew more or less uh, by the key words, what they were saying. And uh, I was able to hear the intonations also. Uh, and uh, Audrey helped me a lot, but she was mainly for the pronunciation because we decided that um, Basque is a, is a language like any language in its natural state. It's divided into dialects and there are different pronunciations. But there is, uh, since the 1960s, there's a form of standard Basque called Ayushkara uh, Batua. Uh, uni Basque, uh, unified Basque, and that's what the, the translation of Icharo Borda is in unified Basque, and we wanted everyone to speak in the same way with the same Basque. So for the young people who were, had been scholarized, uh, who had done all the um, schooling in Basque up until the baccalaureate, uh, there was no problem because that's the official Basque that they use in school. But for people who had um, local accents who sometimes uh, changed the uh, a syllable in the words. Uh, Audrey was there like a, a policeman <laughs> to make them pronounce uh, correctly. And also she could hear the intonations and she knew the intonations that I wanted. So I could hear them also in generally, but uh, together we managed to control them so that they spoke, um, they acted in the same way as the actors act in in French or in Italian or Portuguese, in my in my other films, uh, where which are in languages which I can which I can speak. No, I'm sure it was difficult because you the use of language in your film is always very very precise. Um, I'm sure as a director, but from the point of view of the of the audience, we we notice each word, the pronunciation, the way. Obviously, the way they move, but the way they uh, they can um, they do the allocation of uh, you know syllables. So I, I was wondering how you were able to to get that same perfection in a language that you don't speak as well as like French or Portuguese or you know all the other language you speak. Yes, it was thanks to Audrey. Uh, also, uh, in my films in French, people always uh, ask questions about the liaison because I, I asked the actors to make all the liaison, uh, all the possible liaison. And in, in, uh, in, in Italian, that doesn't exist. In Portuguese, there's just one liaison, which everyone makes automatically. But in Basque, there are liaison, and the people don't make them automatically. So we had the same uh, emphasis to, to make them make the, the liaison correctly. I knew the language was important, <laughs> but I did not, I missed out on the liaison as I did not speak Basque, but I'm glad they were there and corrected. <laughs> um, there's um, I, I mean, I love both actors and I think you were very lucky to find, uh, I guess, cousins to, to play this, this role um, of the, the two brothers um, because they, you know, they had, I guess, to be close in age. They don't have to be similar, but they need to look like a little bit for, you know, for, for the movie. But 
I think a lot of the sincerity that comes out from, especially from Atarabi, we really follow. It's the way you, you do all these shots and you use a lot of uh, close-up or um, like medium shots and we see his face all the time. Uh, that is in a way like not moving, but very expressive um, with his vision. So it's, you can see him talking without moving. Uh, and it's, it's why I find it very touching and, and very moving. So can you talk a little bit about your preference to use this type of shot specifically in that film? Yes, well, in, 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 in general, what I'm trying to do when I film something, whether it's a, a person or, or an animal or, or an inanimate uh, object, is to capture the, the spiritual energy which is in the, the subject of the, of the shot. And when it's uh, the, the heart of my films, are, it's always people, of course, so actors. And um, what I'm trying, what interests me most is so is the, their inner life, their, their, um, their inner feelings and their spiritual, uh, their spiritual life. And I find that um, most, uh, most of the times, not always, but most of the times, uh, the best way to capture that is from the, the, the face. So, I use a lot of um, yes, uh, medium and close-up shots, and uh, in it's one of the, um, the stylistic uh, aspects of my films. Uh, uh, since my first film, since uh, Toutes les Nuits, um, that in a conversation I film both um, uh, both people who are talking, and and when we edit, we we change uh, the shot for each. Um, each um, replique, uh, <laughs> uh, each um, line, each line, and um, uh, so um, uh, the the um, the frames follow the intensity of the conversation, and so uh, often when the conversation begins, there are normal shots. That is with um, one of the, the character who isn't speaking, you see part of his back or his shoulder. And so the character who is speaking looks at the character that he's speaking to. But when the conversation becomes more intense, I put the camera between the two people to, so that the spectator sees the, the face of the person who is speaking as, as we see each other in a normal conversation. It's not too normal of not being in the same, uh, in the same room, but uh, it, it will it appear that way when, uh, when the, the audience see, uh, sees it. And, pardon. Uh, and, um, and so, uh, yes, uh, that, that means that the, um, the actor, when he's speaking, looks at the camera directly, but uh, for, the, spec for the, uh, the audience, the spectator, uh, it's as, as if he were in between the two people, the two characters who are speaking to one another. And so the spectator receives all the inner energy that the person who is speaking projects towards the other person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I I enjoy receiving the positive energy of Atarabi. <laughs> I'm not sure I want the energy from uh, Michelat, so I love the actor and I like his part very much. But uh, I, I prefer to follow good to evil. Uh, and to to continue a little bit on the evil side of the film, uh, it was you know your films are serious and funny too because you always bring some humor into the darkness of the world. Um, the way you show the, the devil tavern, the devil rapping, uh, the young men playing around in the, you know, it looks like a kind of a fun e place to be in. So can you talk a little bit about the work that you did on the, the design or the collaboration with the, the set designer and the costumes also, like the devil's costume are great. I recommend some merchandising, <laughs> it would be a big hit. <laughs> Uh, yes, well, um, I, the, for me, the costumes and the, uh, the, uh, everything which you see, which is visual in the, in the frames, is very important. So nothing is left to chance. Uh, for the costumes, I was working with uh, Agnès Nodin, uh, with whom I've worked uh, since Le Monde Vivant. She's done most of my films. And so it's a, um, a very long collaboration. And... Um, 
and for the the um the sets, it was um, Astrid Tonnelier. It's the first time I was working with her, but she's also very good. We got along very well. And I work with both of them in the same way. That is, uh, we talk about each, um, each character, each, uh, each sequence, and uh, about um, the colors, which are very important, the materials for the, the costumes or for the, uh, the elements in the set. Well, we never have very much money. That's that's a problem. But uh, both of those um, uh, both of those artists were were able to do uh, uh, great things with very little means, actually, uh, material means in terms of money. And um, like for the um, well, I, I decided that uh, uh, At Atarabi would be always in blue, and uh, Mikelach in red. Those are traditional colors. There, there is also a form of traditional Basque uh, theater called the uh, Pastorala, uh, which is uh, done, uh, played every summer in uh, Sul, one of the, uh, the provinces of the Basque, Basque country. And it comes from the Middle Ages, actually. And there are two curtains, one on the, um, I think in English you say on, on stage right, enfin, côté, côté court in French, is red. And the devils and all the wicked characters come from that side. And on stage left, uh, Côté Jardin, uh, there's a blue curtain and all the uh, good characters come from that side. So it was as, um, as uh, neatly divided as that. Um, but uh, at the same time, I wanted them to have contemporary clothes because uh, for me, the myth uh, is not in a, a far off time but it's something contemporary. It has something to do with our world that we're living in. So I wanted them to be dressed like young people today. And for the, um, the devil's party, it's actually a sort of um, graduation party because the, the, the devils have been uh, uh, promoted uh, as, uh, as uh, novice devils, like novices in, um, in a monastic community. And uh, so uh, I, w I based it on a scene which I saw once in a Basque tavern um, near Bayen with a group of uh, young men who arrived who must have been rugby supporters. And, uh, and they, they did almost all the things that you see in the devils do in, in, the, in the scene, um, including a, da a dance. And, uh, and so I wanted them to be in uh, sports uh, costumes. And so Agnes found uh, red sports costumes for, for all of them. And um, uh, voila, and for, for, the, uh, for the sets, uh, so we, uh, we discussed every element, uh, uh, the, the slightest objects which you could see. Uh, Astrid always proposed several choices, uh, like Agnes also for the costumes. And uh, we discussed them, and then we uh, we chose one of them. And um, the um, the Devil's Palace is actually uh, it's very strange. But the beginning of the shoot we had to do in Corsica. The rest of it we did in the Basque Country. But the beginning of the shoot was in Corsica because we had very little money, and we received a proposition from the the, the region Corsica in France uh, to uh, a, a subsidy, but we had, of course, it's normal, we had to shoot part of the film in Corsica. And so since the vegetation is too different from the Basque country, we couldn't shoot really exteriors there, but we found um, a, a, a very interesting place for the Devil's Palace, which is in a former um, prison, uh, a very, a very strict prison uh, in Bagne, uh, uh, in, uh, in the 19th century. It's partly underground and uh, it's very cold and damp. All the prisoners always died very quickly you know, when they were there. And we, we only stayed a week, so we didn't die, but everyone got sick. <laughs> and uh, so um, we had a very, the walls were very interesting, but Astrid had to transform the the, the war, this, this, this place into different rooms in the Devil's Palace. And with very little means, material means, she was able to do a, a very good job, I think. So we have all sorts of different uh, places in the Devil's Palace. And um, voila, that's how I, I work with, uh, with them. I'm glad you didn't kill your actors in the palace, which was a Corsican uh, jail house. <laughs> it looked like the, was the Count of Monte Cristo would want to escape. 
but you made it, it she made it sound kind of uh, enticing i have to say it was kind of a fun place to be <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, I wanted to finish on the sense of timing because, you know, like uh, mythology or uh, religious uh, stories, with the sense of time can sometimes be very far apart and very, sometimes very close. And you put it back in a contemporary setting with, you know, like you mentioned the, the costumes. Like the opening of the film is contemporary with the roads and, you know, the cars. And then you go back to like something that could be a very far away past or distant, it's, it's hard to place it. So you work within the context of time within the film, but it's, it's also present, it's, you know. So can you talk a little bit more about the sense of time that you put in the film? Yes, uh, well, that was, uh, you resumed it very well. Uh, I, I, it's a myth, and a myth is something which is uh, out of time, actually. Um, it's one of the particularities of the the three religions uh, which come from the Near East, uh, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, to set a religious a religious myth, in fact, in historical times. But in all other civilizations, a myth is always out of time. It's a, it's a, its own time, actually. It's before b the beginning of historical times, and. Um, I wanted to to um, uh, to make the audience feel that this myth has uh, a meaning for them. That it it isn't something which is a, a story which takes place in uh, in some far away period, uh, but it, it's something which is uh, which has a, a contemporary uh, meaning. And so that's why I began uh, the the beginning credits are on images of the Basque country. Uh, today, we go from Saint-Jean-de-Luz in the northern ba Basque country towards Donostia, which is in the southern Basque country. And, um, and then even it, once the, the story starts, uh, in the Devil's Palace, uh, the devil has, uh, uh, he has um, video surveillance, I don't know how you say that, he has video cameras to, to survey, to, uh, to watch over at Arabi. Uh, he listens to rap music with uh, with uh, a Y on his on his head with uh, uh, and so um, and also he's been to a, a business school and he learned uh, it must have been a, a business school in Harvard or Connecticut because everything he learned is in English he le he says uh, you get what you pay for uh, and, and a deal is a deal uh, so. Um, uh, I wanted to express the contemporary meaning through, uh, uh, I, I wanted the audience to feel uh, the sense of uh, timelessness, which at the same time is a, uh, means that uh, the present of the myth is also the present of, this, of this, the audience. And um, yes, well, uh, I, I, have, I could say other things, but it, it would go too, it would be too long, so. I'll stop there. You can keep the rest for another movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to thank you for uh, talking with me today. I, I'm really, really glad we were able to, to connect in uh, this uh, unusual time. Uh, I love the film, so I hope the audience will feel the same. Um, it's, um, it was a pleasure to have it in the festival. And it was great to talk to you from uh, Paris. I recognize the uh, beautiful red seat of the Unifront screening room. <laughs> Why so many films? <laughs> um, so thank you very much, Eugène. Thank you very much, Florence. And I hope to see you in person uh, soon, hopefully for uh, you know the next few months. <laughs> Once is always hopeful. <laughs> I hope so too. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>